Hey guys, welcome to the 11th episode of Short Bits by Shorty. Um, just a disclaimer, apparently antipsychotic SAI will be also on this exam. So if you need a refresher, please review episode 10, episode 10 from around 440 to around 24 minutes. Ooh, that's a whole 20 minutes. Um... I'm not going to explain everything here because it's not, not the purpose of this video. So please, if you don't remember SAR for antipsychotics, look at episode 10 from 4 minutes, 40 seconds to 24 minutes. Uh, second thing, shout out to my big Winston, my 13th subscriber on this YouTube channel. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want to get updates about when new videos are posted, just like this one. Um, number three, um... Uh, at the end of this video, right after the part where I review everything, I'm going to do a five-question simulation of Glennon's questions with explanations on the answers for those questions. So I'm just going to do Glennon-type questions, and then I'll go through which answer is the correct one um, based on the questions I saw from his last exam. So hopefully those these questions and those answers might help you on this next exam. Um, you can feel free to look at those questions right after the video, or you can study um, this antidepressant lecture and then and then look at those questions. Whatever works for you, they're there so you might be able to learn and help yourself in the next exam. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, your first class of antidepressants are your tricyclic antidepressants. And the first subclass of that are your 676 systems, which um, your prototype for this is imipramine. Ooh, pop quiz, what's the brand name of imipramine? Tofranil. Okay, so the prototype is Tofranil. It's a 676 system because you have a six-membered ring here a seven-member ring here, and a six-member ring here. So it's your six-seven-six system. Um, uh, this is called a dibenz bf azepine. So there's no spaces. Oh, apparently he'll uh, take off points for incorrect format, incorrect lettering from the next exam. Um, so there's no space and no dash and correct letters here. So to name the, the what do you call it, the ring system, the things in the brackets, you're going to find your nitrogen, your nitrogen's here, and you're going to label your faces. So I'll redraw the ring over here for you. So you find your nitrogen right here, now you're going to label the faces A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, so, and you're going to find the face that of this middle nit middle nitrogen ring that attaches to the left and the right rings. So you can see here that um, the ring, this middle ring attaches at the A, B. So A, B, the B side attaches to this right ring. Then C, D, E, F, F side attaches to the left ring. So it's called di bends bracket B comma F bracket azepine because it attaches on the B side and the F side. And remember to use the lowest lettering possible. So what if I gave you this ring? Okay, so if I gave you this ring on the bottom, what would be the lettering for it? Or what would be the name for it? It would be Dibenz one two. So let's go through it. A B C C D E E F G. You could have that, or you could have A B C D. E, F, G. So, um, both give you C and E. So we're going to do C, comma, E. 
Yeah, that's right. Azapine. So remember that use brackets, not parentheses, and use a comma. And be sure to give it the correct letter. Okay, now let's go over the SAR. Okay, so now let's go over the SAR of your antidepressants. Um, just for reference throughout the video, my abbreviations are AD is your antidepressants, antidepressants, AP are your antipsychotics, AC means anticholinergic. Here's where I start referring to antipsychotic SAR. So remember, if you don't remember that, please review the episode 10 from 4 minutes to around four, 24 minutes. Okay, so number one, first SAR, um, unsubstituted non-planar rings are optimal, and planar rings are inactive. So what that means is that if I draw... Here's your 676 system. So, unsubstituted rings are optimal. So, you can't have any substi substituents on these rings. So, for example, you can't have a chlorine attached to the ring. You can't have a uh, bromide attached to the ring. You can't have a fluorine attached to the ring. You can't have anything attached to the ring, or else it's not optimal. Um, so non-planar rings are optimal, meaning that... Okay, so one way to make a ring planar is by adding double bonds. So to make this... To make this 676 system... Planar, therefore non-active. You just add a, add some double bonds, and it's inactive. So to make, so if you want to see if a ring system is inactive, look for double bonds in the middle ring, the ones I circled, and therefore you know it's inactive. Um, the left, the left ring. And the right ring should have ben should be benzenes or should have double bonds. But if the middle ring has double bonds, then you know it's planar, therefore it's inactive. So unsubstituted non-planar rings are active or optimal. Planar rings are inactive. Um, number two, uh, secondary nitrogens are more important than tertiary nitrogens, which are more important than primary amines. So over here, you have a secondary amine, because you only have one, two carbons attached to it, which is more potent than this ring, which has one, two, three, three nitrogen, or three carbons, therefore it's a tertiary amine, which is more potent than this system over here, which has only one carbon attached to it, therefore it's only a primary amine. So secondary amines are more potent than tertiary amines, which are more potent than primary amines. Number three, the ring nitrogen can be replaced by sp2 hybridized carbon or sp3 hybridized carbon. So if you look over here, this is your this is your ring nitrogen, and it was replaced in these examples by carbons. So there's no nitrogen, which are carbons, and these are still optimal. They don't lose their antidepressant activity. Uh, remember that sp2 hybridized carbons. Are carbons double bonded to anything? And sp3 hybridized carbons are carbons single bonded to anything. So that anything can be C double bond O, C double bond S, C double bond C, C double bond N, and so forth. Um, let's see. Number four. Oh, yeah, so in these, these examples, is this one an sp2 hybridized carbon or sp3 hybridized carbon? It's an sp2 hybridized carbon. I'll write that for you. S sp2 hybridized carbon. And is this ring over here an sp2 or sp3 hybridized carbon? 
That's an SP3 hybridized carbon. Cool. Number four. Uh, a side chain of three atoms is optimal for antidepressant activity. A side chain of two car uh, atoms, not necessarily carbons, also has antidepressant activity, but it's more anticholinergic. So, um, side chains, unlike antipsychotics, side chains can be three atoms or two atoms. doesn't really matter. It'll still be antidepressant with similar potency. For antipsychotics, um, a three-atom side chain is the most optimal, where you lose optimal activity if you have a two-carbon, two-atom side chain. So, doesn't matter if you're a three-atom or a two-atom side chain, you still an optimal antidepressant. However, if you're having, if you're, remember from the episode 10, if you're a two atom side chain, you are more anticholinergic. Um, also branching decreases antidepressant activity. It also decreases antipsychotic activity, if you remember from episode 10, but it also increases anticholinergic activity. So in these examples, you have, for this ring, you have a atom of one, two, three, and here's her basic amine. So that's a three atom side chain. Over here, you have a one atom, two atom, and the basic amine. So you have a two atom side chain. So either one has our potent antidepressants. Um, however, which one is more anticholinergic? The left ring system or the right ring system? the right ring system because it has a two atom side chain. Um, let's see. For this branching example, this branching over here, which are attachments to the side chain, um, this is less of an antidepressant. It's also less of an antipsychotic, but it is more of an anticholinergic. Because remember, anticholinergics are branching increases anticholinergic activity. So let's go through some, some examples that he went over in class to illustrate these SAR. Okay, so here are two examples he went over in class. Um, this, this left one is doxepin. This one is... Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this one is... Mm, this one is amoxapine. Okay, so for doxapine... Ooh! Um, pop quiz, brand name. Cinequan. Or... Yeah, Cinequan. Um, okay, so this is an antidepressant because, number one, it's unsubstituted. There's no substitutions on the ring. Um... It's also non-planar, so it has no double bond in the middle, in the middle ring. Um, number two, it is a tertiary amine, but remember, tertiary amines still have activity, even though they're less potent than secondary amines. Um, number three, your ring nitrogen can be replaced by an sp2 hybridized carbon or an sp3 hybridized carbon. So in this case, your ring nitrogen is replaced by an sp, which one? SP2 hybridized carbon over here is an SP2 hybridized carbon. I also forgot to mention that SP2 hybridized carbons are more antipsychotic. Um, so let me write that up there. SP2 hybridized carbon are antidepressants, but are also more antipsychotic. So they have activity at, at as antipsychotics and as antidepressants, but are more antipsychotic. Um, let's see. So for doxepin which is this one over here. This is more antipsychotic 
because of your SP2 hybridized carbon replacing the nitrogen. And number four, it has an n equals three side chain. So one, two, three, basic amine. So it's a potent antidepressant. So for a moxapine, which is oh brand uh pop quiz, what's the brand name? I don't even know. Um, on send in apparently. Anyways, um, so it is a. So would you expect this one to be more um, antipsychotic or more antidepressant? Oh, this one would be an antidepressant, but it would be more antipsychotic because remember antipsychotics necessitate substitutions on the ring. So here's a substitution. So even though it is an antidepressant. It's more antipsychotic because of their substitution on the ring. Um, let's see. It's also non-planar because. Um, let's see. It's also non-planar because it only has one double bond in the middle ring. Um, remember, if you want planar rings, you need more than one double bond in the ring, in the middle ring. Let me write that up top. need more than one double bond in the middle ring. So in this case of omoxapine, you only have one double bond, which doesn't really make it planar. It's a little more plain. It's a little less non-planar, but it's not totally planar. There, so look for more than one double bond in the middle ring, and you have a planar ring. Um, so this is non-planar. I mean, this is still active. Well, yeah, it's still non-planar, but it's also still active because it has not more than one double bond in the middle ring. Um, it has an n equals three side chain. So atom one, atom two, atom three, basic amine. So n equals three side chain. It is a secondary amine. So um, it's a pretty potent antidepressant. And number four. Oh yeah. Um, also, I wanted to note. I wanted to point out that the nature and orientation of the ring are unimportant. So, um, doesn't matter if the middle ring has a ring has an oxygen, a carbon, or a nitrogen, or if these rings are attached over here, but these rings are a little higher. So, if you notice that these rings are actually placed like a, higher than these rings. And on the middle ring, um, so, so here's your oxygen, you have one side, and then your ring. Whereas here, you have ox oxygen, one side, two side, and then your ring. Um, so it doesn't matter the nature and the orientation of the ring. So the nature mean being the atoms within the ring, and the orientation meaning the where the rings are placed in respect to the middle ring, those are unimportant. Both still give you antidepressants. So let me highlight that. Nature and orientation of rings. Unimportant. 
important for antidepressant activity. So nature being um, what's contained in the ring. So it doesn't matter if it's oxygen, nitrogen, carbons in the ring. And orientation meaning where the rings, the left and the right rings are placed with respect to the middle ring. Those are unimportant in terms of antidepressant activity. Either one gives you potent antidepressants. Um, and now this example... Okay, in this example, which is protriptyline, would you expect this to be um, antipsychotic, antidepressant, or both? This is pretty much both because it's antidepressant because it has no substituents. No substitution, substitute, did I spell the word? Substitute, substitutions. No substitutions. Um, let's see. It's a secondary mean. Remember, secondary means are more potent than tertiary means. And antipsychotics require, require tertiary means. Um, but it also might act as an antipsychotic because... Oh, just kidding. Oh no, I read that wrong. It's um, actually more anti-depressant. Yeah, um, I read the wrong thing. Um, so it's more antidepressant because it has no sp two hybridized carbon over here. So sp2 hybridized carbons can occur in, can make molecules either antidepressants or antipsychotics, but the presence of sp2 hybridized carbons makes them more antipsychotic. But it also has keep it also retains antidepressant activity. So remember, sp2 hybridized carbons can make molecules antidepressants and antipsychotics but they make molecules more antipsychotic with some antidepressant activity. It's not black and white, people. There's always a gray areas in things. Um, let's see. Let's see. Do, do, do. Also, it has your n equals three side chain, one, two, three, and your basic amine. Um, so yeah, it is an antidepressant. Okay, so now let's talk about the metabolism of your 676 systems. So first, rapid metabolism is aromatic hydroxylation at the 2 position or the 8 position. Only when the ring nitrogen is present. Meaning you're going to add a hydroxyl group at the 2 position. 2 position or the 8 position. Um, but only at these positions when the ring nitrogen is present. You'll see later why I say that. So here's your ring nitrogen in both rings. You're going to add a hydroxyl group at the 2 position or at the 8 position. Um, and then you glucuronidate it. Next, you can do ND dealkylation, meaning you're going to take off carbons attached to the nitrogen. Um, so resulting in NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites, depending on if it's a tertiary, you start with a tertiary mean or a secondary mean. What that means is, so if you're gonna, let's start at, at the top right here. This is a tertiary mean, because you have one, two, three groups attached to it. But you're gonna dealkylate it or remove a methyl group to produce a secondary mean. So one, two, you have secondary mean. This is your NOR1 or your nor one metabolite or your first metabolite. Then you're going to take off another alkyl group, another methyl group, to produce a primary mean. Primary mean, which is your nor two metabolite. So tertiary means have nor one and nor two metabolites. 
In contrast, your secondary amines only have NOR1 metabolites. Why? Because here's your secondary amine. You have 1, 2, it's your secondary amine. You're going to dealkylate it, remove a methyl group to produce a primary amine. So only one attachment. Um, only one, one carbon attached. So that's, nor, not, that's your NOR1 metabolite. You can't produce a NOR2 metabolite or else you're just going to get rid of this amine group. And it's not even an amine anymore. You just have a ring system, no amine. Um, so, um, secondary amines only produce NOR1 metabolites. Tertiary amines produce NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites. The end result in each case is a primary amine. So, when in doubt, you get to your primary amine. And then label them your NOR1 and NOR2, NOR2 metabolites. So let's see. So your end result of ND alkylation is eventually a primary amine, which may either be NOR1 or NOR2 metab the NOR1 or NOR2 metabolite, depending on if you started with a tertiary amine or a secondary amine. Number three. You can do bridge or benzylic hydroxylation or 10 hydroxylation regardless of the nitrogen in the ring at position 10. Um, so, as I said up here, um, aromatic hydroxylation at 2 position or 8 position um, only, only happens when the ring nitrogen is present. So you can only get hydroxylation at the 2 position or at the A position if you have a nitrogen in the middle ring. However, you can always get 10 hydroxylation at the 10 position regardless of if there's a nitrogen in the middle ring. For example, in this left ring you have a nitrogen here and you have air hydroxylation at the 10 position. However, this ring has no nitrogen in the middle but you can still get hydroxylation at the 10 position. Therefore, 10 position hydroxylation can occur regardless of whether there's a middle nitrogen ring. Um, in contrast to two position hydroxylation and eight position hydroxylation which require a ring nitrogen in the middle ring. And either rat metabolism leads, either hydroxylation pathway leads to glucuronidation then excretion. So 10 position Hydroxylation also leads to glucuronidation. Ooh, cool example he mentioned in class, which is also about doxepin. Okay, so here's doxepin. What would you expect the NOR1 metabolite to be? A secondary mean, tertiary mean, or a primary mean? you would expect it to be a tertiary mean. Did I say, I said, oh, you expect it to be a secondary mean. Because you start off with, I don't know what I said, tertiary mean here, now you're gonna make it a secondary mean. So which is more potent as an antidepressant? The parent structure or the tertiary mean or the NOR1 metabolite, which is your secondary mean? So, the NOR1 metabolite is a more potent antidepressant because remember, antidepressants require or are more potent with secondary means compared to tertiary means. Oh, cool example, right? Okay, so now let's talk about your 666 ring systems, which are termed that way because you have a 6 membered ring, a 6 membered ring, and a 6 membered ring. So, 666. Uh, ring system. Um, so remember that, so in vivo or in, in cells, 666 ring systems are converted to planar structures. Um, forgot to label this as planar. 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 Um, this is planar because remember I said earlier that planar structures have more than one double bond in the middle. 
Um, so one double bond doesn't there doesn't necessarily make a one one double bond in the middle ring doesn't necessarily make a structure planar. However, two double bonds in the middle definitely makes a structure planar. Therefore, inactive. Remember, planar rings are inactive as antidepressants. So in vivo, 666 ring systems are converted to planar ring systems, which are inactive as antidepressants. So, how do we get around this? Well, Brett's rule states that you cannot have a double bond at a bridgehead. So, um, I showed you, I'm, just gonna sh I'm showing you two examples, which are pretty much the same, except the bottom one has a double bond at the bridgehead. So, the head of the Here's your bridge in the middle sticking out, and then here's your double bond at the head of the bridge, or at the front of the bridge. So, double uh, Brett's rule states that you cannot have a double bond at a bridgehead. So, in the top example, this actually exists because there's no double bond at the bridge head. Whereas this one, the bridge head, which is over here in front of the bridge sticking out, has a double bond Therefore, it cannot exist because it violates Brett's rule. Um, these are just different perspectives of the same structure. So looking at, looking, like from bird's eye view, looking down, this is what you see. But if you go, if you stand right next to it and you look up at it, you'll see the bridge head sticking out. Same thing for this one. This, these are just different perspectives of the same structure. So... 666 ring systems can exist as long as they have a bridge head, for example, as long as they have a bridge. Um, and in vivo, cells cannot add double bonds to the middle ring, as I said earlier. So over here, in vivo, um, no double bond is converted to two double bonds, therefore it's planar intracellularly. However, cell, if cells try to do it with mulk, with ring systems with a bridge in the middle, um, they cannot do it because they violate Brett's rule. Therefore, adding the bridge in the middle prevents cells from adding double bonds to the middle ring. Therefore, keeping the 666 ring system non-planar, therefore, as active antidepressants. Um, if you want an example of that, here is maproletine, which is an antidepressant. So here's maproletine. Um, in, another, in another perspective, with a bridge. Um, See, so yeah, looking down at the molecule, the it looks like this, but once you go down to the ground floor and stand right next to it, and then look up at it, this is the perspective. So you can see the molecule does not have a double bond at the bridge head, therefore this 666 system can exist um, because cells cannot convert this to a planar compound because you can't add double bonds to this ring because there's a bridge head. So therefore it's an active antidepressant. Also 666 ring systems are turned tetracyclic antidepressants like I said up here because they have one, two, three at the bridge, and then four, four rings. So one, two rings, third ring at the bridge, and four rings. Okay, so here's a little chart that some upperclassmen made from a long time ago. Um, still pretty valid because they have all these points, all the correct points. Um, this is just a little t figure table that compares antipsychotic SAR versus antidepressant SAR. I'm not gonna go over it because it's everything I've already said. It's just a summary of everything that you need to know for this exam in terms of antipsychotic SAR, antidepressant SAR. So thank the upperclassmen, especially PDC. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about the tricyclic antidepressants and their mechanism of action. So the monoamine biogenic amine hypothesis states that depression is associated with a, a, with a deficiency of norepinephrine and or serotonin at brain synapses. Therefore, tricyclic antidepressants block the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin, therefore leaving more of them in the synapse, which supports the monoamine slash biogenic amine hypothesis. Um, so increasing the concentration of norepinephrine or serotonin in the synapse decreases depression symptoms since depression symptoms are associated with deficiency of these neurotransmitters at brain synapses. So why is the onset of effect of antidepressants delayed by about four to six weeks? Um, so according to the neuroreceptor adaptation theory, um, Recept uh, neurotransmitter receptors, neurotransmitter receptors try to maintain homeostasis inside the sin inside the synapses at the synapses. Um, so, neur if the neurotransmitter concentration at the synapse increases, the receptor the number of receptors decreases or downregulates. Uh, and whereas, if there is more neurotransmitter in the synapse, the receptor number increases. So, to illustrate this, um, you have um, increased number of um, neurotransmitters, and you have about five receptors. Therefore, you're going to downregulate, or you're going to make the, the cells, the brain cells, less sensitive to these neuro, um, neurotransmitters by decreasing the number of receptors. And the brain or your body tries to maintain homeostasis by decreasing sensitivity to this increased number of neurotransmitters so that your brain can come back, go back to its original state of um, not as much activated um, brain cells because of the increased number due, even though you have an increased number of neurotransmitters. Uh, in contrast, with decreased number of neurotransmitters, your body increases in the number of receptors in order to cope with this increased number of neurotransmitters. To, so increasing the number of, neuro of receptors increases the body's sensitivity to these neurotransmitters, therefore are upregulating the number of receptors, therefore allowing the body to cope with this increased number of neurotransmitters, therefore increasing the effect of these neurotransmitters on the body. So, if basically your stricter adaptation theory tries to account for uh, the body trying to maintain homeostasis by, in by uh, the body adapting or changing its sensitivity to this number of receptors, to this number of neurotransmitters in the body by increasing or decreasing the number of receptors in the body. It's all about homeostasis, so the body tries to maintain its uh, normal levels or tries to cope with increasing or decreasing amounts of neurotransmitters in the body. They do this by increasing or decreasing the number of receptors in the body. It's all about homeostasis. Um, so that explains the onset of effect because the body has to either decrease or increase the number of receptors in the body, and that takes time, namely four to six weeks, um, according to that theory. Um, so the serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine are all acted on by transporters, and these transporters belong to solute are solute carriers. Um, they belong to the solute carrier six family or SLC six family, where SLC uh, is abbreviation of solute carrier. These are 12 membrane spanning structures that allow binding and the passage of norepinephrine and serotonin into the neuron. So in this picture I drew you um, the neuron and here is either cert, net, or dat. These are 12 membrane, 12 transmembrane structures. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 mem transmembrane structures that allow 
Let's see. Norepinephrine, serotonin, or dopamine to pass through into the neuron depending on the transporter. So... Norepinephrine is that. And these are sodium-dependent symporters. Remember, symporters are transporters that move things in the same direction. So sim means together, same, together. Porter means transport. So as serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine are transported into neuron, so is sodium. So these are sodium-dependent symporters where as sodium moves into the neuron, so does norepinephrine, serotonin, or dopamine. Um, norepinephrine belongs to the SLC6A2 transporter. Dopamine binds to the SLC6A3 transporter. And serotonin binds to the SLC6A4 transporter. Um, so net, the norepinephrine transporter, is termed 6LC6A2. DAT, which is the do dopamine transporter, is SLC6A3. And serotonin CERT um, is your SLC6A4. A uh, way to remember this is need more serotonin. So in depression, you need more serotonin. So you need the uh, need need the serotonin. I need the serotonin. I need serotonin. So six, a two, three, and four. Going down two, three, and four. You have need serotonin. Hope you get that. Um, so in terms of these transporters. Uh, most tricyclic antidepressants have little selectivity for net and cert and can block both. Some even have selectivity for either. It's shown that tertiary means have the least selectivity and primary for either transporter. However, uh, pro the, 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 the secondary means typically favor net or the norepinephrine transporter. So, if you metabolize, if you metabolize a tertiary mean, which is little selectivity, to its dwarf one metabolite, which is a secondary mean, you can increase the selectivity for net. So remember, secondary means have increased favor for net, and tertiary means have least selectivity. So metabolizing a tertiary mean to its secondary mean, or its normal one metabolite, increases its favorability for net. Okay, so now we're going to talk about your reuptake inhibitors. Um, so just a few concepts. So the potency and selectivity of um, your antidepressants are not related. All SSRIs block norepinephrine at higher doses. So even though you have selectivity for uh, serotonin, you can also block the norepinephrine transporter at higher doses. And to get from your tricyclics to your uh, SSRIs, you can remove one of the faces, which allows for increased selectivity over um, CERT, over NET. Um, to illustrate this, so you have your tricyclic antidepressant and mipramine over here. Um, so removal of this face, so removal of this face, leaving it empty over here, allows it to be more selective for serotonin. Uh, specifically, mod changing the structure of mipramine eventually gives you fluoxetine. So remember that removing the top face, leaving an open top face over here, gives you more selectivity over serotonin. And this structure is a prototype, it's fluoxetine, so no fluoxetine, also no mipramine, that's also your prototype. So fluoxetine blocks CERT, which is your solute carrier 6A4 or SLC 6A4 transporter. And it's the first SSRI I use clinically. The S isomer is more potent than the R isomer. The S isomer is metabolized slowly, leading ooh, slowly, leading to a long duh, duration of action. 
Um, so yeah, the metabolism of the S isomer slowly over a long period of time explains its long duration of action. So you can dose it once weekly, think. I, don't know, I didn't really study yet. Um, the major metabolite is norfluoxetine, which is your primary amine. So if you see here, fluoxetine is a secondary amine. Uh, metabolizing it gives you a primary amine, which is norfluoxetine, shown here, which is your primary amine. Um, you can tell the difference between your SSRIs and your SNRIs because your um, SSRIs have groups para to your oxygen. So review or go a little. You have your benzene ring. Here's your major group. So the group next to it is ortho group. Two spots away from it is meta, and group directly opposite to it is para. So, SSRIs have groups para to the oxygen. So here's your oxygen, here's ortho, meta, para. SSRIs have um, your groups para to your oxygen. In contrast, your SNRIs like uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Hmm. I should not use that abbreviation. Okay, so let's call this your selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor in. Norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like tamox, tamo, tamoxetine, riboxetine, lysoxetine have groups ortho to your oxygen. So here's Here's your oxygen group. This is ortho, so that's saying now it's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have groups para to your or oxygen group, whereas your selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors have groups ortho to your norepinephrine nor ortho to your oxygen group. Um, your selective norepin your selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like venlafaxine and duloxetine, you can tell that they are selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors for this exam, for the medchem part of the exam, because they have a bioassisteric second ring. So if you've noticed that this first ring, second ring are benz is a benzene. This f first ring, second ring is benzene. However, for venlafaxine and duloxetine, which are your selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, this first ring, second ring isn't a benzene. It's actually just uh, all single bonded carbons in a ring. And duloxetine is not a benzene, it has a sulfur in it, not all carbons. That's, that's how you tell you have selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, so to review this part, your SSRIs have groups para to your oxygen. Your selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, like tomoxetine, riboxetine, mesoxetine, have orth uh, groups ortho to your oxygen. Your selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, venlafaxine and duloxetine, have the second ring as bioassisteric. So these are not benzenes. Not benzenes as second rings. Levum nalsoprab is a new selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It has two chiral centers. I'm not going to draw them for you because it's not that important, but I think he wants you to recognize that levum nalsoprab is your 1S2R isomer. And to explain how norepinephrine and serotonin are so related, you have the concept of heteroreceptors or heteroreceptors. 
where some serotonin neurons possess norepinephrine receptors. Uh, specifically, activation of the alpha-1 adrenoceptor by norepinephrine enhances serotonin release, whereas norepinephrine activation of your alpha-2 adrenoceptor diminishes serotonin release. Okay, before I start the meta uh, monoline oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs, just wanted to point out, in case it might be in the exam, you never know this guy, um, that Simbax is a combination of fluoxetine and olanzapine. Olanzapine. Mm, easy to remember that is sim combination of fluoxetine and olanzapine. Um, okay, now on to your MAOIs. Um, let's see. Your monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So, monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that catalyzes, catalyzes the, the oxidative deamination of amines. So, Oxidative deamination means you're adding oxygens, and deamination deamination means you're removing the nitrogen. So to illustrate this, you have serotonin over here. Now we're gonna do now MAO is gonna catalyze it. So if you look at this amine over here, it's gonna turn into acid, carboxylic acid. So over here is your acid, and it's also gonna turn it into an alcohol. So here's your alcohol. So I produce so. Monoamine oxidase, oxidase produces both acids and alcohols, not just one or the either. Um, in long form, remember that in the process of turning serotonin into an alcohol and an acid, you're going to turn it into an aldehyde first. So here's your aldehyde group. Um, so before serotonin is converted finally into an acid and an alcohol, it must turn it into an aldehyde first. And then this aldehyde turns into an alcohol and an acid. So the ratio of acid to alcohol depends on number one, the nature of the substrate, number two, the physiological conditions. So MAOIs work by blocking MAO, and by blocking the metabolism of serotonin and norepinephrine, you increase their synaptic concentration, therefore decreasing the bio the depressive symptoms according to the monoamine slash a biogenic hypothesis. I think that's the name of it. Um, let's see. So, the susceptibility of your amines to oxidation depends on the structure. So, number one, um, primary amines are more susceptible than secondary amines, which are more susceptible than tertiary amines. So, here's your primary amine, which is more susceptible to MAO than a secondary amine. So, one, two. A secondary means are more susceptible to metabolism by MAO than tertiary means. One, two, three. Methyl groups on the nitrogen are more susceptible to ethyl groups on the nitrogen, which are more susceptible to um, T -but butyl groups. So T butyl groups. So here's your methyl on your amine, which is more susceptible than ethyl. So one carbon one carbon two on your amine which is more susceptible to MAO than tert butyl groups. So here's a tert butyl group. Here's your, it's called tert butyl group because it has a butyl, four carbons, so one, two, three, four, attached to the nitrogen. Um, and groups attached to the alpha carbon, which is the carbon next to the nitrogen, um, are less susceptible to um, oxidation by MAO. So adding more groups to the alpha, hydro alpha carbons in decreases its metabolism by MAO. So here's your alpha carbon, which is the carbon next to your nitrogen. So adding a group there makes it less susceptible to MAO metabolism. And adding another group to the alpha carbon, which is the carbon next to the nitrogen, decreases its metabolism by MAO. So um, to summarize, so the hmm, the left side, this whole region, indicate your most susceptible 
are your least stable to MAO metabolism, whereas the ones on the right side, all of this, are your least susceptible to metabolism by MAO or are the most stable. So why do different groups lead to different stabilities? Um, to illustrate this, here's your monoamine oxidase enzyme and here's your amine group. So the mean group has to fit into the enzyme in order to be metabolized. However, adding more groups like ethyl group or even terbutyl group pushes this amine away so that, it, so that it won't fit into this enzyme anymore and it won't be metabolized. Remember, things have to fit in enzymes to have the reaction happen. Um, likewise, adding alpha groups on the alpha carbon also push um, uh, the molecule away so that it can't be metabolized by MAO. It's all about how the molecule fits into MAO. If you add groups on or near the nitrogen then you're gonna push the molecule away from MAO so it won't be able to fit into MAO to be metabolized. Another important concept is that um, ND alkylation to NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites may occur before metabolism to MAO. So you can metabolize compounds to the NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites leading to secondary and primary means in order for them to be metabolized by MAO. Because remember MAO works best on primary means, secondary means, over tertiary means. Um, so metabolizing them to your primary mean and your secondary mean or your NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites allows them to be metabolized better by MAO. Oh, also wanted to point out, in case he does test us on this, you never know with this guy. Um, the only aldehyde drug because drugs are not usually aldehydes because aldehydes break down in the body very fast um, the only aldehyde drug is chlorohydrate um, okay so before I start talking about the classes of MAOIs just wanted to say that MAOIs MAOIs are your oldest class of antidepressants. Okay, so your first class of your MAOIs are your hydrazide ones. And these are termed so because they have hydrazides. So here's your hydrazide. It's your N, single bond to an N, carbon, double bond to an O. So look, N, N, and O. That's your hydrazide in the middle. These are your oldest members. Your cyclopropylamines, means that's not a prototype by the way, but in case he asks you if what a hydrazide is, you know what a hydrazide looks like. Um, your cyclopropylamines, your prototype, this is a prototype, so you actually have to know this one. Uh, your prototype is tranylcypramine, shown below. Um, your trans isomer, so it's called tranylcypramine, tranylcypramine, because tran refers to your trans isomer, which is more potent than the cis isomer. And there are four possible isomers for this. Um, let's see. Um, blah, blah, blah. so your hydrazides and your channel so uh, your cyclopropylamines, including your channel cypramine, are your first generation MAOIs. These are long acting, irreversible, non selective, and they have many side effects. Um, however, your REMAs, which is your reversible inhibitors of MAOIs, are shorter acting, safer, produce, uh, fewer side effects, and our second generation. Uh, might be important to know that MAO, the different MA monoamine oxidases. So MAOA favors um, serotonin and norepinephrine, and MAOB favors dopamine. Okay, so now we're going to talk about your second generation antidepressants, which include a lot of classes. So your first one are your aeropiperazines, which are actually L-caps. These block norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake, and they also bind to 5-HT1A. They also act as 5-HT2A antagonists, and these include velazidone, which is an SSRI, 
but it's also a partial 5-HT1A agonist. So remember I said aeropiperazines also bind to 5-HT1A. Well, velazodone also binds to 5 is an aeropiperazine in that it binds to 5-HT1A and acts as a partial agonist. Your true test... So before I said there, there are tetracyclic antidepressants. Um, your true tetracyclic antidepressants um, include mirtazapine. Um, these are weak blockers of net and CERT, and these are non-selective 5-HT1, 5-HT2, 5-HT3 antagonists. Um, why isn't it? Okay, cool. Um, flibanserin. Um, is a 5-HT1A full agonist, uh, 5-HT2A antagonist, and a D4 partial agonist. Um, easy way to maybe remember this is your serins are your 5-HT2 antagonists. So that fills in one bubble for you. Um, let's see. Full. Full. That's an, that's you. Whatever. Um, your triple reuptake inhibitors act at all three neurotransmitter transporters, CERT, NET, and DAT. This includes DOV216303. Bupropion analogs act more on dopamine than norepinephrine reuptake, and they're inactive at CERT. Serotonin modulators include vortioxetine, which acts on CERT and NET, and also at other 5-HT receptors. Um, organic cation and transporter inhibitors um, so you know that CERT, NET, and DAT belong to the SLC6 family, which are high affinity, low capacity transporters. However, organic cation transporter inhibitors act on SLC22, solute carrier 22 family. These are low affinity, high capacity uh, transporters, and they are polyspecific, meaning that they can act, they act on more than one transporter. Not just NET, not just CERT, not just DAT, they can act on CERT and DAT. CERT and NET, or NET and DAT, they're polyspecific. Um, you find OCT in glial cells, and glial cells are responsible for metabolizing neurotransmitters. So if you block the, if you block the OCT in glial cells, you block the metabolism of neurotransmitters, therefore leaving more of them in the synapse. So here's a picture summarizing the mechanism of antidepressants. So your somato somatodendritic or cell body autoreceptors are your 5-HT1A receptors, um, and your terminal autoreceptors are your 5-HT1B, 1D receptors. So activation of either one shuts down 5-HT biosynthesis and release respectively. So um, activation of your somatodendritic or your cell body receptors, or your aka your 5-HT1A receptor, shuts down 5-HT biosynthesis. Whereas activation of your terminal autoreceptors, aka 5-HT1B, 1D receptors, shuts down 5-HT release. Um, which is, leaves the potential for um, 5-HT1A or 5-HT1B, 1D antagonist. So if you so antagonists at these receptors would antagonize shutting down serotonin synthesis or release. So these antagonists will block shutting down, therefore releasing and making more serotonin. Those are just possibilities. Um, let's see. Postsynaptic receptors are your 5-HT2 receptors. Important note: 5-HT. 1A. 5-HT1A is found pre- and postsynaptically, whereas 5-HT2 is only found postsynaptically. Um, remember, you also have your alpha-1 adrenoceptors, which are found presynaptically. And these, activation of this, remember I said earlier, cause 5-HT release. Whereas your, your alpha-2 adrenoceptors, which are also found presynaptically, um, activation of these receptors diminishes, as I said earlier, 5-HT uh, release. Um, 
let's see, your targets also include 5-HTT, 5-HT6, and there isn't, there isn't 5-HT, 5-HT6 agonist, which is EMDT. Okay, so the last thing on this lecture is the gene theory of depression, which accounts for things like PDE5 inhibitors, um, acting, being able to relieve depression, um, and the time course for uh, the onset of action for antidepressants. So, let's see. I wrote out the steps for you in the pathway of the creation of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. So, let's go through it. Number one. The neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine, interact with your GPCR, your G protein coupled receptor. Now, your G protein coupled receptor couples with cyclic AMP, and then cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. This activated protein kinase A phosphorylates CREB, which is the cyclic AMP response element binding protein. Um, activate, phosphorylating CREB activates CREB. An activated CREB creates brain activates brain derived neurotrophic factor BDNF, and BDNF is a nerve growth factor that promotes the growth of nerve cells and new connections. Um, so, importantly, um, sec this pathway can be disturbed by phosphy stopped by phosphodiesterase or PDE. Um, so, and PDE uh, metab or uh, phosphorylate cyclic AMP to 5' prime AMP. So phosphodiesterase stops the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor by breaking down or phosphorylating cyclic AMP. Um, it's found that stress and depression decrease CREB, which decreases BDNF, and therefore leading to nerve cell damage and death. However, antidepressants increase CREB therefore increasing BDNF, therefore promoting the growth of nerve cells and new connections. So this theory accounts for the action of PDE5 inhibitors on depression and for other antidepressants. And it also accounts for the formation of new neurons and neural connections through BDNF, which takes about two to six weeks. Um, this pathway can also happen through the PI coupled pathway, not just the adenylate cyclase, cyclase coupled pathway, which includes cyclic AMP, but you can also produce um, CREB by the PI coupled pathway, which means you're by production of calcium and DAG, diacylglycerol, DAG. So you can have two ways to get CREB through the adenylate cyclase pathway, coupled pathway, which produces cyclic AMP. And you know the rest. You can also get CREB through the PI coupled pathway, which produces CREB through calcium diacylglycerol (DAG). Finally, he talks about Dr. Glennon talks about ketamine, whose active isomer is S-ketamine, which does not act on NET, CERT, DAT, 5-HT2A, 5-HT1A, DA, and D2. Basically, it doesn't act on your normal traditional pathways. Mechanism of action is unknown, but more importantly, it doesn't act on your serotonin, norepinephrine, and or your DAT transporters. Okay, to review, um, if you don't know your um, antipsychotic SARs by now, please review episode ten from four forty from four minutes forty seconds to twenty four minutes. So, triastic like antidepressants include your six seven six ring systems. Prototype is amipramine. Um, to name your structures, um, find your nitrogen, label the faces around the nitrogen, and you always want to, and find the faces that attach to those um, rings next to it, the left and right rings. Use the lowest letters, so in this case it's A, B, C, T, E, F, G, so B, F, uh, it's di, bends, bracket, B comma F bracket azepine. Please use those. No parentheses, no spaces, no hyphens. Um, let's see. Your SAR, you need an unsubstituted non planar ring and planar because planar rings are inactive. Remember, planar rings have more than one double bond in the middle ring. Um, secondary means are more potent than tertiary means, which are more potent than primary means. 
your ring nitrogen can be replaced by sp2 hybridized carbons or sp3 hybridized carbons. Be careful because sp2 hybridized carbons have more antipsychotic activity. But they're still antidepressants. The world is not black and white, people. Um, your side chains have can be your side chains are have antidepressant activity if there are three or two atom side chains doesn't really matter but remember two atom side chains are more anticholinergic um, branching produces more anticholinergic activity it also decreases antidepressant antipsychotic activity um, blah 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 the nature and orientation of the rings is unimportant for antidepressant uh, activity you can have anything inside. You can have anything inside the ring and around, and you can put the rings and around anywhere on the middle ring. Doesn't really matter. You'll still produce an antidepressant. Um, metabolism. You can have two or eight position hydroxylation only when the nitrogen, middle nitrogen, the nitrogen in the middle ring is present. Is present. Um, Remember that aromatic hydroxylation at any position produces glucuronidation. Release the glucuronidation. You can have N alkyl dealkyl N dealkylation, where you produce NOR1 and NOR2 metabolites, um, depending on if you start with a tertiary amine or a secondary amine. Your end result is eventually a primary amine. Um, uh, you can dealkylate or N dealkylate before you metabolize by MAO. Uh, ten hydroxylation can occur regardless of whether you have a nitrogen in the middle ring. Remember that hydroxylation always leads to glucuronidation. Um, six 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 ring systems they are inactivated intracellularly to produce in to produce planar compounds because they have two double bond. So more than one double bond in the middle ring produces planar compounds. So how to get around this? You use Brett's rule by producing a bridge in the middle because double bonds at bridge heads cannot exist. The limit does not exist. Guess what movie that is? If you get it, I'll give you a high five. You gotta tell me in school too. Um, here's your summary comparing antipsychotics and antidepressants. Uh, mechanism action of tricyclics and antidepressants. Um, so deficiency in, according to the monoamine dot biogenic amine hypothesis, de depression is associated with the deficiency of norepinephrine and serotonin at brain synapses. Therefore, um, tricyclic antidepressants block the reuptake of these neurotransmitters, leading to increased synaptic concentration. So why is this onset of action delayed? Uh, well, the receptor adaptation theory states that in order to maintain homeostasis, the brain changes your sensitivity to these neurotransmitters by either increasing or decreasing their number of receptors. Because receptors, increasing or decreasing the number of receptors changes the brain sensitivity to these neurotransmitters. So more receptors means more sensitivity to these neurotransmitters. Less receptor means less sensitivity to the effect of these receptors. Um, so decreasing the number of receptors is called downregulation. Increase in number of receptors is called upregulation. Um, CERT, NET, and DAP belong to the SLC family. Remember, need serotonin. So NET is SLC 6A2, DAT is SLC 6A3, serotonin is SLC 6A4. These are 12 transmembrane spreading structures that allow binding and passage of norepinephrine and serotonin into the neuron. These are sodium dependent SIM porters, meaning these neurotransmitters are. Tra are um, sent in the same direction as sodium through the neuron. Uh, most tricyclic antidepressants have little selectivity for net and cert, can block both. Some even have selectivity for either. Uh, tertiary means have less the least out selectivity, whereas uh, secondary means typically favor net. Um, to have more f uh, selectivity for net, you can metabolize tertiary means to nor one metabolites, or their secondary means. So uptake inhibitors. Um, fluoxetine is your prototype. Um, let's see. Uh, your, let's see. Remember your SSRIs, fluoxetine has um, your substitute substituent group para to the oxygen, whereas 
Um, let's see. Your selective norepinephrine and your uptake inhibitors have the group ortho to your oxygen. Selective serotonin norepinephrine and reuptake inhibitors have the bioisosteric second ring, which are not benzenes. So if the second ring is not a benzene, then it's probably a selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, <laughs> like venlafaxine and duloxetine. Levomilnazepram is the 1S2R isomer. It has two chiral centers. Um, your heteroreceptors, heteroreceptors, um, let's see, whereas for the alpha-1 adrenoceptor, norepinephrine activation enhances serotonin release, whereas for the alpha-2 adrenoceptor, norepinephrine activation diminishes serotonin release. Mono means oxidase. Uh, remember, monomine, monomine oxidases produces um, acids and alcohols through aldehydes. So aldehyde is intermediate product, whereas the final product is acids and alcohol. The ratio of these products, acid to alcohol, depends on the nature of the substrate and the physiological conditions. So blocking MAO, MAO through MAOIs blocks metabolism of serotonin and norepinephrine, allowing the synaptic concentration to increase. Um, Susceptibility of amines to oxidation depends on the structure. So primary amines are more the most susceptible or the least stable, whereas tertiary amines are the most sus least susceptible or the most stable. Methyls, methyl groups are the most susceptible, the least stable, whereas um, tert butyl groups are the least susceptible or the most stable. Um, no substituents on the alpha carbon are the most susceptible or the least stable to MAO, whereas Substituents on the alpha carbon are least susceptible to MAO or are most stable to MAO. Why is this? Remember, the amines have to fit into MAO. So any adding anything longer or next to the amine um, won't let it fit into MAO properly. Your classes of MAOIs include hydrazides and cyclopropylamines. Um, these are your first generations. So they're long-acting, irreversible, non-selective, and they have many side effects. Remember, channel, sopram channel cypramine is your trans isomer, which is more important than your cis isomer. Um, remas are your second generation. Uh, they're shorter-acting, safer, and produce fewer side effects. Remember, MAOA acts, uh, favors tr uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. MAOB favors dopamine. Um, your second generation antidepressants include your aeropiperazines, true, your true tetracyclic antidepressants, flibanserin, triple relapsing inhibitors, bupropion analogs, serotonin modulators like vortioxetine and organic cation transporters inhibitors. These all act on dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin in different ways. Be sure to know which ones are agonists, antagonists, or whatever in terms of... Um, those neurotransmitters. Here is a summary of the mechanisms of action of everything. Let me know if it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, it's just a summary of everything that's happened in the last few weeks um, in terms of mechanisms of action. Here is the gene theory of depression or your blue, the blue gene theory of depression, whereas the creation of BDNF is the most important factor. Um, BDNF produces new nerves and neural, neural, neuronal connections, which takes six, about two to six weeks, which accounts for the delayed onset of action. Um, this can occur through either the denylate cyclist pa coupled pathway, which produces cyclic AMP, or production of BDNF can occur through the creation of the PI coupled pathway, which produces calcium and DAG, diacylglycerol. So stress and depression decrease CREB, which decreases BDNF, which, which causes nerve cell damage and nerve cell death, whereas antidepressants regenerate CREB, therefore regenerating BDNF. Um, this accounts for PD-5 inhibitors and everything I said earlier, because PD-5 is responsible for breaking down cyclic AMP to 5' prime AMP. So PD-5 inhibitors stop the breaking down of, stop the phosphorylation of cyclic AMP, Therefore, it allows cyclic AMP to therefore produce BDNF. Um, ketamine mechanism action is not understood, but it doesn't act on your traditional CERT, NET, or DAT transporters and your active isomers as ketamine. 
So before I start the review part, say hi to Two's dog Franklin. Hi Franklin. Oh, is this video gonna play? Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. So cute. Um, if you want to follow Franklin on Instagram, here's his handle at hello Franklin. Um, I don't think you can hear the video, the audio. Let me play it one more time for you. <laughs> Anyways, um, okay, so here's the review part. So here's five questions, Glennon style. Um, you should know the concepts, and if you know the concepts, you can apply them to answer these questions. So number one, which one, A, B, or C, reflects the most potent antidepressant? Also, I'll give you five seconds if you want to pause or think about it. Um, like, literally pause the video. Um, here's your five seconds. Okay, so to get this question, it's actually C. Why is it C? So A, um, you have your tertiary mean. Um, B, you have a bromine over here and a primary mean. And here you have your secondary mean. Um, in all of these, you have your n equals 3 side chain. But remember, your secondary means are your most potent. Also, substituents on the ring decrease antidepressant potency. So you can cross out one because B because it's a primary mean and it has a substituent. You're left with A and C. Um, everything being equal, they have N equals 3. Um, no substituents. However, C is more potent because it's a secondary mean. Remember, secondary means are more your most potent antidepressants. Number two, which represents an inactive antidepressant? Um, it is B. Remember, um, two double bonds in a middle ring produce planar compounds, which are inactive antidepressants. A is your prototype for channelcypramine. C is fluoxetine. Um, so yeah. Two double bond, more than one double bond in the middle ring produces inactive antidepressants because they're planar. Number three, which is the least susceptible to MAO oxidative deamination? It's actually A. Um, let's see. It's A. So A is a tertiary mean with branching on the alpha carbon. Um, B just has a methyl group, nothing on the alpha carbon. Um, C has nothing on the alpha carbon, but it has an ethyl group. So you know that ethyl groups are less susceptible to MAOI oxidative deamination compared to, pro to methyl groups. So if you're stuck, so you can definitely cross out B because there's nothing on the alpha carbon and it's just a methyl group. Now you're stuck with nothing on the alpha carbon and an ethyl group, or you definitely have something in the alpha carbon and you have um, tertiary mean. So you have two things that leave A sus less susceptible to de deamination, whereas you just have the ethyl group. So definitely A. So A, you have. Um, A, you have branching on the alpha carbon, and you also have a tertiary mean. Whereas C, you just have no alpha branching, and you also have an ethyl group. Um, so two factors compared two factors in A compared to just one factor in C. So you. A is less susceptible to MAO oxidative deamination. Number three, number, oh, fast. Number four, which is a possible product of MAO oxidative deamination of nortriptyline? So here's nortriptyline. You have three choices, A, B, or C.
Um, the answer is C. Remember, oxidative deamination by MAO produces alcohols and acid. This is not an alcohol or an acid. This is not an alcohol or an acid. But this is an acid. So C is the right answer. Remember, MAO oxidation happens on the nitrogen. Look for the nitrogen for MAO and see if it's an acid or alcohol. Number five, which is more selective for CERT? Answer is A. Cool. Remember that removing the side connecting the two rings, left and right ring, modulates selectivity for CERT. So I'm talking about this one and this one. So these have the side connecting these two rings at the top. You cross out B and C. However, um, there is no side connecting these two rings, so it's A. Hopefully that was helpful. Just wanted to show you that if you understand the concepts, you can apply them to answer Glennon style questions. Um, if you have anything, let me know. Otherwise, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, let me know. Um, also, feel free to leave feedback at pollev.com slash C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-R-U-I-629. Um, feel free to leave feedback. Anything positive, anything constructive, I'll take it. I appreciate anything. Um, anything to make the next episodes better. Um, yeah, have a good exam, too.